my partner, Doug, in our first three months, three months, June 22nd, was actually killed by a drunk driver coming home from work. And that was a tough time for us, not only because of that, but we had, I believe the war in Afghanistan had just started. And that was really the first like televised war, if you remember that. Yeah. Everybody sat home and watched it. And that, uh, that war started like a month after we opened and nobody was going out. And the restaurant, Luca, just never, it never opened. Like we were expecting it to open just like they, like Mizuna. We thought this is going to be great. It's Italian, everything's from scratch. And it was horrible. Podcasting from Boulder, Colorado. This is the Baby Got Backstory podcast, where we dive into the story behind the story of today's most inspiring storytellers, creators, and entrepreneurs. I like big backstories, and I cannot lie. I am your host, Mark Gutman. This episode of Baby Got Backstory is sponsored by Wild Story. (laughs) Wait a second. I bet you're saying, isn't that your company? It is. And without the generous support of Wild Story, this show would not be possible. Brands across the world are discovering that their overall strategic and verbal approach, also known as their brand story, is what glues them together and drives who and what they really are. Are you one of those brands that is taking advantage of this superpower? Are you finding that showing up consistently, both internally and externally, is a problem? Or maybe you can't tell your brand story in two to three minutes in a way that captures the interest of your employees and customers. Then get in touch with us, the team behind Wild Story. We can help. I want you to go back in history, about 20 years or so. And specifically, I want you to think about the food and restaurant scene here in America. The idea of a chef as a celebrity was just starting to percolate in the American consciousness. But outside of Wolfgang Puck or Emeril, very few people knew the names of chefs. The Food Network had launched in 1993, but the programming was far from revolutionary. It was standard cooking fare, a chef in a white coat, standing at a stovetop, pouring ingredients into a pan, doing shtick like bam and pow. And that was sadly enough at that time. The idea of foodies, people who understand and obsess over food, and that there was even an ecosystem, if there were foodies, of a bunch of restaurants that could serve them, none of that existed. Most fine dining and memorable dining experiences were out of reach of most people, especially if you didn't live in New York or LA, and especially Denver. If you wanted fine dining, you had a choice of one or two restaurants that were inaccessible to most people and stuffy. And that's where we start today's story, with Frank and Jacqueline Bonanno, the husband and wife team behind Bonanno Concepts, a Denver restaurant empire that started with a chance opportunity to start a single restaurant and has grown the Bonanos into recognized culinary stars, not just in Denver, but across America. I'm Mark Gutman, and on today's episode of Baby Got Backstory, how a young couple fell in love over food and turned that love into a business empire that feels like a family. Before we get into today's show, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen and absorb these amazing stories. I truly believe that stories shape our world. The foundation of any great story is empathy, simply defined as the ability to understand and share the feeling of others. Or put another way, to hear someone else's story and say, hey, they're just like me. And every time we hear a story, we are searching to locate ourselves in that story, how it relates to our own experience, and how we can connect to someone else's. It's hardwired into our brains, this need to connect and find meaning through the experience of others. And it's through this connection, this empathy, that we're able to really be seen and heard, to really see and hear. And when our minds are open like this, we are ready to have an open mind to possibly change our minds. And when we change our minds, we change the world. Whether it be something grand, like our worldview, or something more tangible, 
like how we see a brand and its relevance to us in this world. And I'm pretty excited that we're making some history here on the Baby Got Backstory podcast. I actually have a correction. So in our very first episode with Luis Benitez, I mistakenly reported that the Colorado Outdoor Recreation Office was a $6 billion industry, zero six billion billion dollar industry. Right after that episode uh, was released, I got a ton of feedback calls and even Luis sent me a very nice Facebook messenger chat to let me know that it's actually a $60 billion industry, six zero for the Colorado outdoor recreation industry. So that's quite a lot of cheddar. Quite a big correction. I was off uh, by about 10 times and want to make sure that we correct that. Now, if you like and enjoy the show, please take a minute or two to rate and review us over at iTunes. iTunes uses these as a part of the algorithm that determines ratings on the Apple charts. And ratings help us to build an audience, which then helps us continue to produce this show. And lastly, this show is all about creating value for you, as well as opening up a dialogue And I realize I'm doing all the talking, but please, let's start the conversation. I am at Mark Gutman on all social channels, and you can always send an email to podcast at wildstory.com with your thoughts and comments. If you have any great ideas for guests, please let me know. Any suggestions are welcome. Frank and Jacqueline Bonanno have built a restaurant group in Denver on the values of pride, family, and excellence. If you talk to any of their hundreds of employees, they'll all tell you the exact same thing. Not only will they tell you this, but they believe it with all their hearts. They believe they are family. They have tremendous pride in what they do and know that the product they are providing is excellent. It is clear that these values permeate their business and their culture because this is how the Bananos view food and its place in our lives. Since opening that first restaurant in Denver, Frank Bonanno has become what we call today a celebrity chef. Guest eyes light up when Frank stops by a table or prepares their meal. And the front of the house is run by Jacqueline, and her vision for each of their concepts shifts the output from being a place to grab a meal to a full sensory experience. They are known for restaurant concepts at the highest echelon. Mizuna, fine French dining, all the way to the quaint neighborhood dive bar or lounge, Vesper Lounge and everything in between. In total, they have created Mizuna, French 75, which is accessible French, Osteria Marco, a neighborhood place for everyone, also called Denver's most recommendable restaurant, Luca, which is neighborhood Italian, Salt and Grinder, neighborhood deli, Bones, uh, which is a hot and steamy ramen and Asian French fusion uh, restaurant, Smokehouse, which is Colorado barbecue, Green Russell, which is craft cocktails, the delivered in a speakeasy environment, and they have just opened up the amazing milk market. A giant food hall in the dairy block near Coors Field that is unique in that they own every concept. There's no guilt in going from stall to stall, and it really feels like the full expression of what is happening in the Denver and American food scene curated by Frank and Jacqueline Bonanno. We conducted this interview sitting in the wine room of their very first restaurant, Mizuna. And here is their story. All right, so I'm here with Frank and Jacqueline Bonanno. And can you please tell us where we are and maybe describe a little bit about uh, this this venue that we're in on location? We are sitting in our back wine room. We added this about 10 years ago to the restaurant. This is Jacqueline's brainchild, this room, and how to make it pretty out of taking something from Lancer Lounge. Yeah, we're at Mizuna Restaurant, nearly 20 years old. Yes. Yeah, in our elegant little private dining room. Yeah, and why is Mizuna special? What's what's this restaurant represent? This was our first restaurant that we started uh, almost 20 years ago. And I think it was something that really started our vision of who we wanted to be as restaurateurs. And, And... How could we push the boundaries of what was going on 20 years ago, culinarily and service-wise? Yeah, Frank actually started this without me. Uh, He, with a former general manager at Mel's Bar and Grill, that's where he used to work um, as the executive chef. And he and Doug Fleischman opened Mizuna together. They had a really rare opportunity. The chef that occupied this space had gotten tired of being in the restaurant business. And um, 
we were on our way home Christmas and that gave Frank a call and he said, I have a really great opportunity for us. Awesome. So that was almost 20 years ago. So even before that, were you always into cooking, Frank? Were you, as a kid, were you cooking? And, and can you tell us just a little bit about like what your upbringing was like? Yes, I had a tremendous upbringing. Um, basically, I, I did like the food service industry and I surfed as a kid. And the best means for me to surf during the day was to work in a restaurant at night to make money when I was in high school and college, you know, during breaks and stuff. So I worked in a lot of red sauce Italian places uh, in the Jersey Shore. And basically, you know, it evolved for me. If the waves weren't good, I'd go in and help prep in the afternoon. You know, I'd go in and help cook for two reasons. One was my food always came up faster because I had been in there helping the guys cook. And two, I really started to love what I was doing. I, I just loved Italian food. And that's kind of what led to me doing this. I really landscaped a lot of landscaping as a kid, which I knew I hated. And just my family's business is real estate. And there really was no room for me to move into that business with older brothers. So I knew I needed to go out and do my own thing. And so when I came out to go to DU as a finance accounting major, when I graduated, I could not find a job. But I knew how to cook and I didn't want to move home with my parents. So I took a line cooking job at a restaurant that was just opening here in Denver that my mother suggested. And it's, uh, it's kind of all gone from there. I then decided the people that were working above me were making more money and they were making more money because they'd gone to culinary school. So after about four years of cooking after college, I decided to go to culinary school because I knew this is what I wanted to do. And that's really interesting. So you didn't come from a family that was based in food service or restaurants, from what I'm hearing. Is that correct? That's absolutely true. Yeah. And so, and, and I know family is very important to you, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that a lot uh, throughout the conversation today. But what did they think when you were getting into food service? Were they supportive of it? Were they like, what are you doing, Frank? <laughs> absolutely not. My father, we didn't tell my father I was cooking for about a year and a half until after I decided I really was going to do this seriously because he wanted me to get into real estate or finance or something, or something different. The world was different business wise. Restaurants were not what they are now. No food network, no TV, no glamorous chef. It was, uh, it was a horrible business. And in, in the eyes of my father, he had invested in some restaurants and lost money and he did not see that as a means to a living. So until I decided I was super passionate about it and wanted to do it, my mom knew the whole time, but uh, she was always super supportive. My sister also very supportive and they just supported me. And then when it was time to tell my father that this is what I think I want to do, you know, he of course jumped right on board. Did he really or? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. 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 That's funny. We, um, when we purchased our first house, we also lied to his dad for two years that we didn't tell him that we purchased the house. We told him we were renting it. Everyone was afraid. You don't want to rock the boat, but then he's this amazing man always. So yeah, he's supportive. <laughs> and you mentioned Italian food and that you, you loved cooking Italian food was, you know, I, I understand that, you know, your family wasn't in the restaurant business, but what was food and what place did food and Italian food specifically have in, in your family growing up? You know, food was, my mother, my mother will tell you she's a terrible cook. No uh, way. And I will disagree with that. My mother was a very good cook who loved to watch Julia Child and would love to try and recreate her recipes. My sister is a spectacular cook and baker. And it was just part of who we were. Like we, Sunday was always pasta night and Friday night was my parents' date night, so we always ordered a tap pizza from Rudy's. And, you know, as I got older and I was the last child left in the house, I mean, we had roasted chicken thighs with, like, fresh rosemary on them and a big salad five nights a week for dinner, which is to this day why I don't eat chicken very much anymore. But it wasn't so culinary. We went out to dinner a lot, which is something that exposed me 
to great food. We would go into New York. We lived really close to New York. It was those experiences of them taking us out to dinner is what really got the bug going in me and cooking with my mother and my sister. Yeah. And so you, you mentioned that it's not really even about, or it wasn't about uh, the food itself, but it sounds like more about the experience and the, and the, the family being together. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. I, yes. I would say that the family being together for meals, we sat down to eat dinner as a family every night. Um, and that's something we try and continue even last night with our family. You know, it's just that that's where stories are told. That's where that's where bonds are made is over a dinner table and sharing food. And I have always believed that. And I believe Jacqueline believes that as well. Yeah. Cool. And so I, I want to hold there for a second. And so Jacqueline, what about you? Like, where'd you grow up and were you into the food scene? Uh, I'm from Indiana. I have five sisters and it was uh, pretty clear that the six of us were going to have to pay some part of our college so we start, we all waited tables all the way through high school. I, st- I got my first job working in a restaurant when I was 14 as a dishwasher at a Farrell's ice cream parlor. And when I moved to Denver to go to college, I waited my, my way through college. And when I graduated, I taught English for a little while, but I always, my, my last restaurant job before I came into our, our restaurant business was at Barolo Grill, waiting tables. I mean, I love it. It's, it's, awesome. The restaurant business is fantastic. It's energizing. It's fun. It's interesting hours. Great people. Love it. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting that the both of you started in the restaurant space as a means to an end. Like you needed a job. Like, look, this is an accessible job. I can I can work in a restaurant as a, as a server, as a cook, what, what have you. But then you develop this love for the restaurant business. And do you, each of you remember like kind of when that flipped for you? Like when you decided like, hey, like, I really like like this. This is something I can do, and that actually, this is something I can be great at. I think for me, it was in college when we were having parties at our ho- at our house with all my fraternity brothers, and just us throwing a cool party that had food at it instead of just like kegs. Like all my friends were into food, and I would spend all day cooking, and we would have like a dinner party in college as crazy as those years were, but it would start out as a dinner party and we would eat and drink wine. And that was when I knew people were like, you're, you're pretty good at this, you know? And I would always try different recipes out on my roommates and that that's what really gave me the bug to go do it. And when we graduated and I couldn't find the job, as I said, it was, I should go try this. I've done it like in like very casual red sauce places, but you know, let, let's go see what, what I can do. You know, I had good knife skills and it was just something I thought I would try. And I, (laughs) I love throwing a party. And I think there's something to be said about having perfect group of people laughing over a glass of wine. When I was in college, I used to take the doors off the hinges and put them on milk crates and clear out all the furniture. And we'd sit on pillows around the door and so, and it would fill up the entire apartment. There'd be 20 of us for dinner. Love it. Never considered it to be anything close to a, a real job, even though it paid my bills and afforded my lifestyle until I fell in love with a chef. And, and then the two of us, we fall asleep talking about food or talking about our most recent experience dining out or what a different restaurant looked like, or why this one was getting old and fussy, and why this one was new and exciting. And as our conversations developed around food and service, it just it just seems kind of magical to see those visions come to light in our own venues. Well, we did fall in love in my first job after culinary during culinary school. That was, that was the coolest graduation I've ever been to in my life was a culinary school graduation because the incoming class of culinary students serves dinner to the graduates. So you sit down at a table for 10 and this, the speech is a motivational speech. And at the end of it, the graduates sit down at the table with you and the incoming class serves you dinner. It's amazing. It was really fun. <laughs> Just random. Jumping ahead. <laughs> and what, what culinary school was that, Frank? Uh, it was CIA in Hyde Park, New York. And, and what did you think about that experience? Um, that experience was great. It was expensive. Um, and I think that 
I learned a tremendous amount that I needed to learn there as far as discipline. Like I didn't have the history and the discipline that cooking often requires that most kids didn't don't get. Like it's it's more of if you learn the proper way to do something and learn it really well, you'll be good at it the rest of your life. You'll be well-rounded. Whereas, you know, when I went to culinary school, that's when Food Network started. And I would say more than half the kids wanted to just be on TV and didn't really think that they were going to be chefs. So I, that was the, the precipice for the turning point in, in the industry was right then in 1993 was you had celebrity chefs. I didn't go to school to become a celebrity chef. I just knew I wanted to own my own restaurant and do things my way. And this helped me. Like there were so many parts of it where you learn front of the house, you learn wine, you learn all that. So many kids that were in the school with me were like, well, I don't give a crap about wine and I'm never going to be a server, but you're not looking at the big picture then. You're not looking at like, if you want to own your own restaurant, you have to be in charge of those positions. So for me, it was, it was very eye opening, and I had weighted tables. So for me, it was a way to kind of hone those skills. So I knew what I wanted in the front of the house. I knew, I knew wine really well. I, that the class, the class that you took for culinary school was like the most intense class and only like 8% of the people ever passed it, but it was fine. And I learned a lot and it, that's what helped round me into who I am today. I, I believe that from culinary school. Would I recommend kids go to it today? No. Save that money, go work abroad, go to a, take that $40,000, save it, go work in a restaurant for free for three months at a three-star Michelin restaurant in France or Italy or Spain, and you'll come back and you will make your money back so much quicker. Yeah than coming out of culinary school. Cause now I think they're just churning. So it's not a, a knock. Some kids go to culinary school and come away great and go for the right reasons. And I think that today's student coming out is so ill prepared to be a line cook with huge debt that it's hard to pay them what they need to be paid in order to do the job to you need. Their them. Debt. Yeah, to do the job you need them to do. They're not qualified just because they went to school. I, th I feel like it's probably the same with college, right? Graduate as a finance major. What are you really qualified to do? You went to college and you learned some finance stuff. I, d I don't know that you're qualified to get a $90,000 a year job right out of college. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, you think about this this rise and this craze of Food Network. I mean, when you started, it really was on the beginning of that curve. I mean, we, we weren't as in tune with things. Like, we didn't have, like, foodies. I mean, it wasn't a hobby, you know. I mean, people right. just have so much knowledge. I mean, you can come to any restaurant and you have, you know, it's kind of like when you go to the doctor and you show up and you're like, I've Googled 8,000 things <laughs> about what I have. And you're, you're already like this, like, uh, quasi experts. I don't want to say an expert, but you just have all this information and you can throw information around. And uh, I would imagine, is there actual uh, data that says like the, that there's more chefs coming up or are there less, or do you know that the state of the industry right now? I would say that there are not enough cooks to service the restaurants here in Denver. Labor is a big problem. I think all across the country that that being said, I think that it is just very difficult to find the quality of person who wants to step back and learn and grow in a position because you can go make 50 cents more an hour tomorrow working across the street. And the attitude is, is I, I can, I just want money. And so the passion is not there that, that was there 20 years ago. It's like, hard to remain passionate when you have a huge college loan bill that you're trying to pay off. Sure. And right? cost of living here is crazy. Yeah. I that mean, that yeah. is the other biggest issue is that the cooks can't afford to live here. Yeah. And when you're stressed out about if you're making your bills, you just can't be a good employee, right? Yeah. It's, it's hard to have passion when you're, when you're just getting by. But the thing is, is if, if people could just step back and look at what it is that they're doing and say, you know, I can suck this up for a year and, and eat ramen in my room 
and get this experience, I'll make twice as much money in three years because of the experience I've gained. Rather than jumping for a dollar, dollar, dollar an hour, you find, and I see them, I still work with some of the guys that I worked with 20 years ago that are still chasing that 50 cents an hour raise, but they're in the same position. They were working side by side with me 20 years ago, or 23 years ago yeah. when I was a line cook. And they're still just line cooks because they couldn't step back, take that $5,000 pay cut to become a sous chef, which then inevitably leads to chef, owner, whatever it is. It, there are so many people, bartenders, that just will not take that small step back financially that would put them in a position to be a leader and, and make more money as a salaried position with paid time off. And that, that, that's the one thing I see is the, the biggest hindrance in our field. Like I, I think in other fields, like if it was architecture, if it was a great architecture firm and you were given an opportunity, you might take a small pay cut to go there because the growth opportunity is better in our industry. It's, pay me. And it's also hard to imagine that this is actually your career. A lot of people think that they're serving or working as a cook as a means to an end, that one day they're going to have a different job, a bigger job, a different career. And by the time they realize that this is truly their career, they've missed these opportunities to grow it as a career. Yeah, that, that's really insightful. What are you doing, if anything, to to address that? Do you have any ideas around how to help this next generation of server of line cook to, to see that? I mean, is that coming out anecdotally and in, in advice you give them or do you have any thoughts around that? I would say one of the things that we try and do through EO is an accountability chart, right? That's put up in every restaurant so you can see what the flow is, who's the manager you need to talk to, what who's in what positions. And if you're smart, you'll realize like, hey, I noticed that guy up there on that chart makes more money than me. I want to be that person. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate people that this is, this is what we are at Bonanno Concepts. And there are all these positions up here and you're on this chart. You could move up and make more money and be a bigger part of what we do. Like our director, director of operations, Emily Schwartz, didn't come to us from some business school. She came to us organically through the restaurant industry, started out filing, and now she's our director of operations. Uh, actually, everyone on our leadership team is somebody who came up in the restaurant business to, I don't know, these pretty amazing positions that they're in right now. Yeah. And, you know, I've been around your your restaurant group, and I do want to get into that and kind of what the makeup looks like in a little bit. But I have noticed that to your point that you, you can have a great career you know, Epinano concepts. And so that to, to be, to realize that that's a possibility is a real opportunity versus maybe like a smaller restaurant where you're like, Hey, this is just a, there's nowhere for me to go. This is an end to a means, but you know, that you are really building careers in the, in the restaurant industry. I think that's really, really amazing. Right. Yeah. I'd like to change gears and, and, and just drop back a little bit. So I was thinking as I'm sitting here and, and, and looking at the two of you, I wish I would have taken you both into like an isolation booth and asked you this question separately, <laughs> but you can answer it together. How'd you guys meet? And tell me about that story. <laughs> <laughs> we, we tell this story pretty differently. Um, <laughs> I was waiting tables my last year in college at Rattlesnake Grill and Frank was doing his externship for culinary school and we fell in love across the line, I would say. Um, actually, <laughs> the... The first time that we went out with a group of people dancing, I had to kiss him to stop him from dancing. And um, and then I was in love. Let's hear your version. <laughs> um, my version is that it's very similar. I was working at Rattlesnake Grill doing my externship, and there was this amazing woman who was a waitress there that just stole my heart and captivated me and was so loud and so funny and that that was it and i wasn't a shy kid but she would take we would go out and then finally we went on our first date to piatti yeah their opening night and you know we've been together ever since so that's 25 years yeah, yeah two kids later a bunch of restaurants a bunch of restaurants <laughs> yeah so tell me about that first date at piatti 
I remember our first date at Piatti was we criticized a lot. Yeah, we did. <laughs> like we would do something different and this, it was good. It was just fun. It was fun to be out. It was awkward. It was an awkward first date for sure. Because we'd been flirting for a long time. It was the first time that anyone in the restaurant that we worked with knew that we were flirting or dating or anything. Ran into a hundred people that we knew who were clients, who were coworkers. Um, it was fun. It was exciting. We were young. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you mentioned, I mean, you, you, you're criticizing at Piatti, but even you, Jacqueline, had mentioned that uh, it was something that you just bonded over over the course of, you know, as your relationship developed, this idea of food and and uh, what was going on in the restaurant scene and what was going on at that time. What was going on? I would say, I, okay, so in Denver, the fanciest restaurant in Denver was Barolo Grill. Uh, it was the only place that had this, like, super amazing extensive wine list that I, all Italian – they were just really on their game. But there was, without passing too much judgment, I feel like there was really no one else that was doing beautiful, amazing food. Rattlesnake, Fousey, they were at the Cherry Creek Mall. Like who thinks of a mall restaurant as being something really cool? But they were. They were conquering all their tomatoes for their sauces. And they were just doing some really cutting edge things that kind of opened my eyes I remember walking into the walk-in at Rattlesnake Grill and there were bouquets of basil. And prior to that, the restaurants that I worked used dried basil. I mean, that sounds kind of alien right now, but this is 20, 23 years ago. There weren't bouquets of fresh basil and arugula and um, cooks used to thaw out the meat before they cooked it. They weren't ordering things that were freshly butchered. It was eye-opening. It was really cool. It was an exciting time to be in food. I, I would say the same thing. When I walked into Fuzzy for that job, the, f the funny thing is, is like I had spun pizza, right? I walked in. That was going to be my first job. I had worked at Anthony's Pizza during college a little bit. And when I went to Fuzzy, it, it was eye-opening with what they were doing, their pastry department. Like they had a pastry department. They had... You know, we were taking fresh tomatoes and peeling them and making sauce every night. And they had a wood fired pizza oven. And one day the pizza guy didn't show up. And, I, you know, I put my hand as chef, you know, I, I can, I can make pizza. And he's like, have you ever used a wood burning grill? I, I have one at my house. Yeah. I've done it a million times. And, you know, after that shift, you know, it, it was different. You know, it wasn't like just, pepperoni and, and sausage that I'd made a million times. This was like fresh arugula. This was ingredients I really hadn't worked with ever on a pizza. Goat cheese, like as stupid as it sounds to say goat cheese today on a pizza. But in 1993, that was pretty innovative, right? So at the end of the shift, the chef came up to me and he said, you've never used the wood-fired pizza oven before, have you? And I said, no. And he's like, Okay, tomorrow, if you burn half as many pizzas as you burn today, you can stay on this station. And I said, okay, great. And he's like, you're lucky you know how to actually make a pizza because I was very fast at making them. I just didn't realize they would cook in two minutes. So I was very accustomed to, you make the pizza, you throw it in, and eight minutes later, you have a pizza. So that that was that was eye-opening. And you couldn't let the fire go out. And you like it wasn't just a gas knob, you turned. So... It was very eye-opening in that respect of like what was going on food-wise because, as I said, coming from just red sauce places where we par-cooked all the pasta and we made a marinara sauce and we did stuffed shells and chicken parm to see that this Italian restaurant wasn't doing any of that. They were making their own fresh pasta. They were doing everything from scratch, and that's – if you would ask me that, what was the moment? It was that moment when I saw what is possible with food that I had never seen. And I'd gone out and eaten in a bunch of great restaurants. And I don't think you put it together until you see what it takes to produce that food. And when I saw that, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't just the food either. At Rattlesnake, we had to iron the tablecloths. If you were a manager there, you had to wear at least two inch heels, a dress had to be this certain length. You had to be pressed and starched and showered and fresh. You took pride in everything from the moment you walked in the door, polishing silverware, the way that you served the food, the way that you took it away from guests. 
And that was the first time that I was ever proud to work in a restaurant. I was proud of the food I set down. I, w- I was proud when I was running in the floor. And it was really exciting to talk about it too. Like we would go home at night and we would recount every step of service. And when we went out, that's what we would do after dinner. Well, what'd you think of the wine? I don't like the way that they poured this. I love the way they did this. We could do that. It was pretty neat. It was fun. We still do that. I would say 90% of our conversations that, that Frank and I have are centered around food, food yeah. and service. And why does that matter? Like, why does it matter how the pizza is made or how the wine is poured or that you're proud to service the food? You know, I, I think that to probably 80% of the people that go out to eat, it doesn't. But to that 20%, it does. Like, we, we, Always during restaurant week, get a review from somebody that says they took away my silverware after every course. And it'll be a bad review. And it'll be a bad review because that was intrusive. Well, no, that's proper service. You you get, you're eating, you're paying, you deserve, a, even if you didn't use it, we may give you a different fork for your fish or your meat or a different knife. So those were some of the things. It's just the little details that y- you you pay attention to. And then as my career grew and working in different restaurants, that the level of what they were doing was so high, you realize it's these little things that make an experience so great. And I don't think that, you know, there's plenty of room for the macaroni grills of the world and people love the super fast food. But I think once you start seeing it, like I did at Fousey with the food and at Rattlesnake, the the quality of the service, like that, that's like, that that's where you're like, this is all coming together. Like Rattlesnake, the food, we were making a la minute sauces, like a la minute per blanc sauces. And, you know, that's just not something I had ever seen. And, and to be able to do that, and like Jacqueline said, getting in a whole halibut and not defrosting everything, you know, that that's eye opening to, to, to people or to me as a cook, to some cooks, it just meant like, what a pain in the ass. I got to break this fish down. I don't know how to do that. I don't want to learn how to do that. I want to grab a bag and just put it underwater. So, you know, that, that was the turning point for me really was rattlesnake. You know, Fousey was that first place I really worked where I burned a bunch of pizzas but I saw what was possible with a pastry department, like the red sauce places I worked at, like creme brulee, we cooked it stovetop, put it in a cup and served it to you and browned the sugar. Like this was, no, we made it, we made pastry cup that it fit in. We baked it. It was natural cane sugar that you browned with a little iron, like just little steps of things that could make the food so much better. And You know, probably, as I said, 80% of the people probably could have cared less which creme brulee it was, the one that was scooped into a cup and blowtorched, or the one that was baked and in a shell that was really thoughtful. But that 20% of the people is who we wanted to serve. Yeah, and um, you can feel that in in most of your restaurants, right? Or not all of your restaurants, that there's this elevated experience of really trying to do something different with food and everything from this, you know, idea that most of your restaurants, I think, if not all have, you know, you make things from scratch and, you know, like, I don't think people really even know what that means. Like, you know, making things from scratch literally means making things fresh every day, things that don't exist, things not from cans. And then that that elevates the experience kind of going back to what you're talking about and all those pizzas you burned. Like, I know you love pizza. Like what's so great about pizza? (laughs) It's like a donut. It's a snack. It's not a meal. <laughs> you eat a slice of pizza. I, um, no, I think there's the thing to me about pizza is that it is the most artisanal food. It's just like pasta. You start with flour, water, and yeast. You cultivate it, and then it goes into a really hot oven. You put fresh cheese that you've made, fresh mozzarella that we've we've made on top of it with some really quality imported Italian tomatoes and fresh basil. Like I, I just, the simplicity of pizza is what I love. That is it. It's, it's the most artisanal thing to me in cooking 
there could be. And then pasta is a close second because it's the same, it's eggs and it's flour and it's hand rolling it through a machine. And then it's just three or four other things you're putting with it. And, and that's what I love about it is, is that you're letting the crust or the dough be the star of what it is you're making. Cause that's what you spend the time doing. And it breaks my heart. We'll go out to eat. And it's like, that pasta would have been great if it didn't have 16 ingredients on it. Like if they had just stopped with what a bacon, Parmesan and arugula, that would have been great. I don't know if it needed the kale, the galanga root and all the other shit that the people put on it. But I think if you just, if you keep it simple, that that's why I love pizza because it's just that it's simple. It's, it's, Honest, good, simple food. And Do you eat pizza? Love pizza. We have pizza at our house at least once a week. Do you? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, and certainly my kids do. I mean, but you know, and there's what I find so interesting or intriguing about pizza is, to Frank's point, it is a very simple food. I mean, we can sit here and list the ingredients, but there is a very big spectrum of pizza. You know, you have everything totally. from, you know, Stuff that's not very good, you know, inexpensive kind of big box pizza. You have that's frozen cool. pizza. You have artisanal uh, wood fire pizza, right? You and, and then ingredient. I mean, there's just simple food, big spectrum of of what yeah. it is. You know, it's all pretty good though, isn't it? For pizza, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, so I judged the pizza competition in Las Vegas, and I had to eat thirty different slices of pizza in like a three and a half hour period, and. You know, for the most part, all pizza is pretty good, but I have things that like aren't like you don't put semolina flour on the bottom of a pizza to get it off the peel and get it in the oven because then it burns and it's crunchy. And I don't like that. Like to me, pizza is you like the pizza you like because it's what you grew up on. And, and I, I can't relate that enough. Like when people say they don't like my pizza they probably grew up eating pizza from a different place that did a different style of pizza. So you're accustomed to that and that's what you like. I, I mean, I tell the story of when I would drive, we would drive people home back to New Jersey after during college. And like, we would drive literally from DU to Rudy's pizza. And it would be like the best day of my life. Cause I haven't had Rudy's pizza in like, you know, three or four months. And some people would be like, that's eh, okay. And I'd be like, what do you mean it's okay? It's okay. <laughs> and Jacqueline feels the same way. Like my kids are like, yeah, it's good. It, but to me, it's still 40 years later, I still think it's the best slice of pizza I ever can get. But it's because it's what I grew up on. Like we have kids that come over that are friends with our kids that come over and they live in the suburbs. They eat Pizza Hut and Domino's. Yeah. They don't understand when we bring in – Blue pan pizza from the neighborhood up the street. And they're like, yeah, it's okay. When our, when our kids bring their friends to Osteria Marco, we ha I have a rule that you have to order one of the pizzas on the menu. You can't just have a cheese pizza. You, you have to order a pizza on the menu. And my, my sons are so embarrassed by that. But like, this is the age. You're teenagers. You got to try something different. You have to try an artisan pizza with roasted red peppers and a spicy sauce. Because if you don't try it now... Your pizza hut for the rest of your life. Yuck. Yeah. I mean, has there never been a better age for pizza? Right? No, <laughs> this, this is the time. Yeah, I the mean. golden age. Yeah. 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 So what makes, like, in your opinion, like, what's the, the perfect pizza? The, my, my perfect pizza is either just – I love the pizza at Luca right now in our wood-fired oven. I love the tomatoes. We put some fresh copa on it that we make and arugula. And tomatoes and our fresh mozzarella. Like to me, I could eat that every day. Uh, and I love a margarita pizza because nothing tells you if a pizza is good or great rather than just good tomatoes, basil, olive oil, and fresh mozzarella and dough. Like if you hit those five things, then I'll trust you with any other pizza you make. So for me, it's, I keep it simple. Yeah. So what should we look, be looking for as we're, we're sampling pizza out there? I mean, what are the things that we need to, to grade the pizza on as uh, a professional pizza judge? <laughs> <laughs> crust, salt, saltiness in the crust. That's probably salt and sugar in the crust. The crust needs to taste like something. So much of it is cardboard now. 
I want to taste a little bit of yeast or, you know, at Luca, we use a starter at Osteria in the milk market. We, we don't because we're doing such volume, but we still use fresh yeast instead of dried. And I think it gives the crust a little more flavor. And then the bottom, I like, I don't care about flaccid pizza. Yeah. Right. That's not important. If the pizza slumps when I pick it up, like I like the little crack, if I can get the triangle split on the pizza when I fold it. But if I'm ordering a 12 inch pizza, I'm not expecting that because it's too small for it to develop into a big, thick crust. I'm looking for 16th of an inch thickness, not too much flour on the bottom when they put it in the oven, because then that burns and then you can taste that. So I'm just, it's technique is what I'm looking for, I guess, really, is does the person that's making the pizza care? Yeah, I might be looking for it too. You know, I was raised on uh, Detroit deep dish pizza. Have you tried Blue Pan? Uh, no, I have oh, not. That's good. It's is Detroit it? deep dish pizza. Yeah. That's their thing. It's yeah. good. I was raised at uh, a bar called The Gathering Place in, in Troy, Michigan. You were raised at a bar? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. That's, <laughs> you know, same thing, right? There, there just wasn't a lot of options. So we had The Gathering Place and uh, parents would drink beer and we would crush, you know, square deep dish pizza. I love that. We, yeah. we burnt out on the deep dish pizza. Just we were because when so Blue much. Pan came to our neighborhood, we were ordering it like, like twice, two or, yeah, yeah, twice, twice a, a week. week. <laughs> well, I, I might go there today. <laughs> It'll be good. Well, I want to go back and talk a little bit about and get get back on this timeline. So, you know, set me straight a little bit. You're coming out of culinary school. Have you got you guys have met? Correct. Yes. You're, you're together and. I'm sure a lot of people come out of culinary school and go, I'm going to open a restaurant. No, and not us. No. <laughs> no. Tell, tell me about that. Tell me how what, what happened But there. you kind of always knew you were going to. I, I mean, you had a real estate finance background. You went to culinary school. I mean, you, you have that tucked away. So when I was getting close to graduating from school, I was obviously communicating with Jacqueline. And she was looking for opportunities for me here in Denver. And she called and said, there's this guy, Mel Masters who's opening up a restaurant in Cherry Creek, I'm going to send him your resume. And so when I graduated, I knew I wanted to come back out to Denver because I love Denver. And so I came out and got an interview with Mel, thanks to Jacqueline, who set it all up and got the job, started as a line cook, but within like two months became like sous chef. And then, you know, an opportunity presented itself. Mel was expanding and he had this cheap, like red sauce Italian restaurant that he had opened and it was failing miserably. Bruno's. Bruno's. And <laughs> I was like, I could fix that for you. Cause he looked at my resume and knew it had like Villa Victoria, Parma, like all these East coast. And that's what he was going for. So I said that this is not really where I want my career to go. I, I, I don't want to do this kind of cheap Italian food anymore. I'm just going to interject and say that our wine director, Jim Herbst, was a server that we met at Bruno's all those years ago. Like we have people in our, and our direct, our front of house director is the man who introduced Frank and I to one another. Like these are people who are in our lives forever. But anyway, go on with your story. I digress. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I went and I, I went to Bruno's and it was like, obviously the person he had running it knew nothing about like what a chicken parm should be. Like it was simple red sauce stuff. I was able to fix it. I was able to turn it around, make it profitable, get the food cost and the labor cost in line in like six months, get the business up and going. And he was able to sell it for a profit. And for that, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go back and be the chef at Mel's because that's where the, we were doing cool food. And he said, absolutely. So I went back to Mel's and became a co-chef with Tyler Wired, which was a great experience because we both had such different, we had different philosophies of how to do things. Like Tyler didn't know how to do a spreadsheet for food costs, you know, so how, how to keep the numbers in line, how to do all this stuff, running a big restaurant. And I was horrible at ordering and scheduling. Like those are two things even to this day, I am not good at. I do not schedule and I am a horrible orderer. I like my food costs would be through the roof, but I do know how to set up a system that could teach you how to do food costs and ordering. 
So we worked really well together. We split the menu. He took all the entrees. I took all the appetizers and all the desserts. And we worked together for like three and a half years doing it that way. <laughs> so Frank and I got married. Frank is the chef at Mel's. I'm teaching AP English in Cherry Creek. We're coming home from our honeymoon and Frank had been kind of looking at restaurants for the first time, just kind of toying with the idea of whether or not he was ready to open a restaurant. And we're coming home from our honeymoon and um, Frank is like, you know what? I'm going to work with Mel for a little while longer. I have this really great idea on how we be more profitable. I'm going to meet with Mel this week. And he just had all of these ideas for Mel's. He <laughs> Well, because Tyler had given his notice before we went on the chef, had given his the other chef. So this is your time. You're going to be head chef. I'm coming back yeah. to be the head chef. And I, over honeymoon, have devised a plan of how I want to change not only the, not the food so much, but how the kitchen ran. I want to go to a more brigade system and put less chickens in the fryer type of thing. So Frank has all these notes in a notebook and he pulls up to drop his car off at the valet to go have this meeting with Mel. And the valet says, dude, what are you doing here? I thought you got fired. <laughs> and, and Mel had heard that Frank was looking at restaurants while we were on our honeymoon. And it hurt Mel's feelings like he was a father wounded by his son looking at a different business. And the day we got back from our honeymoon, Frank was fired. Tell me about that day. That must have been a shock. <laughs> um, so I, I go to meet with Mel after Charles has told me this in the, after I park my car. And Mel sits down and I have all this business plan, like menus, drawings of how the kitchen should be relayed out. That won't cost anything. It's just moving equipment. And Mel says, Franco, I think it's time you move on. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> he gave me an unbelievable severance package. I think he gave me like four months or something. Back then, that was like okay. tremendous. Asked me to stay on for six weeks to teach everybody. How to make desserts. <laughs> how to make desserts because I was the only one that made desserts. I mean, I was working six days a week, you know, like 80 hours a week. And so I went downstairs and Tyler, my chef was there and he's like, yeah, I'm staying dude. And I was like, okay. And I was like, I, I don't want to stay here for six weeks. And he's like, I don't blame you. I'm like, here are my recipes for the creme brulee and all the other things. I'm like, good luck to you. Ripped it up, walked out, gathered all my books and knives and walked out. But the one thing I will say mm -hmm. about Mel was I would not be sitting here having this interview with you if it had not been for Mel Masters. The man was brilliant. He taught me so much about the restaurant business, not, not just the, so much in terms of knowledge, but all the mistakes that he made, I learned from. I mean, because he opened multiple restaurants, closed them. I saw why he failed when he failed, and it wasn't because of him. He was very brilliant at the concept, the design. It was always that he tried to grow without putting people in place. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those valuable lessons you learn. I mean, Mel sent me all over the world to cook. So er, that's every time I went in to quit at Mel's, well, Franco, what do you think about going to Italy for four months to work? Pasta. <laughs> <laughs> There's this little restaurant in California that's you know, it's new, but it would be fantastic called the French Laundry. When you go spend some time there. So every time I tried to quit in the five years, he would send me somewhere. So there, it, uh, not enough can be said of what that man, Mel Masters, I owe my career and who I am as a chef to him. And him firing me was probably the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Yeah. Do you think there was something there to, to Jackson's point? I mean, she referenced him almost like a father. Like sometimes we don't always display our wishes or emotions to the people we care about in the right way. And do you think there was something to that termination that he was essentially saying, look, it's your time, like go out, like get out of here, go, go leave the nest and do something great. I would love to think that. <laughs> Unfortunately, what my thought process was at the time was I'm going to become a teaching golf professional. Mm. 
So I took my player ability test. I was golfing a lot and took my player ability test at Overland Park and passed. I shot my 72 and 71 or something and passed. So this was like October, November. And in spring, I was going to go look for a job as at like a country club giving golf lessons. That, that was my path that my, my thought process at the time when he fired me, because I took all that severance he gave me and I played golf every day. And then came home and made dinner for Jackal when she got home from teaching. So that that was what my thought process. I'm like, we're going to start a family. We're married. I, I don't need to be in the restaurants till 1230 at night. I could go work at a country club. They make pretty good money. I love golf. I could just give lessons and, you know, help run the clubhouse and merchandise. So I thought that was a pretty good option. So it was that Christmas that we were in the airport coming back, we were like in Newark or something. And I got the phone call from Doug that said, Hey, there's this restaurant. Would you want to be the chef? And I was like, who's Doug? Doug was my partner at Mizuna. And I, he, he was being very coy as to what restaurant. I'm like, you got to tell me where it is. Like, cause I, I need to know. And when he told me that it was aubergine, which in Denver at the time was probably the best restaurant for sure. Well, I, I would say bar not if aubergine was the Sean Kelly was the best chef and this was the best restaurant in Denver at the time. And I was like, hells yeah, I want to do that with you. And he was like, wow, oh, was, I was thinking 70, 30. And I was like, I'm thinking 50, 50. And he said, okay. And that was it. Yeah. And we, I, we came back and three days later, we met here like January 3rd or something. And then we opened March 18th, March 18th. Yes, we signed the lease on February 14th. Valentine's Day. We, he closed Valentine's Day night and we opened March 18th. And why was Aubergine? Why was that up on the block? What happened to that restaurant? <laughs> Sean had twins, was a workaholic, as most chefs are, and was he had done it for 10 years. And he wanted a break and he wanted... He just wanted a break. I think he was just so burnt and he was working six days a week and they were only open five. And, you know, it, it was just something he, his wife, I'm assuming was like, you, you can't continue this. And he just wanted to step back and take a break. And so he knew Doug, they had gone back to God Barolo days, I believe, mm -hmm. and offered it to Doug. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned, you know, being a chef is demanding and tough. Like, what's it mean to be a chef? Like, what? T tell me about that. I think being a chef is who, who you are. I mean, there's dicks. There's not dicks. There's people that can teach. There's people that can't teach. I mean, it, it is, and they can all be successful. That that's the screwy thing about it. Like you, you can be successful and not be great at a lot of things. I, I think my strength is my ability to let go of the vine and let people fail. I mean, my, my favorite thing to do is with a chef is when they tell me a dish that they want to put on the menu, I love to say, go for it. Cause in three weeks I get to tell you, I told you so that no one's going to fucking order that. And then of course, in three weeks, usually I'm 95% of the time I'm right about that, but that 5% I'm wrong. That's always a great moment for me. Cause that's a learning moment for me. So I always feel like it, for me, it's, I can learn from anybody. I can grow. Someone can teach me something new every day that I don't know. And I'm really fortunate that, you know, right now, I mean, there's 125 cooks I work with on a daily basis that I have, I have access to, and there are people I can learn stuff from every day. So for me, it's learning and growing. The hard thing about being a chef is letting go for sure. Because if you're trying to be too controlling, you're probably not going to be successful if you can't trust people to do it. I mean, that would be the same thing in running any business. If you can't let go and trust the people to let them make mistakes, you know, they're not going to learn and grow. And that's going to make it you just controlling everything. Like, you know, I, I don't care what kind of toilet paper you put in the bathrooms. Just make sure it's not sandpaper, right? Like pick something good. I don't need to make that decision. 
And I think that those are some of the things that you do as a chef or as a owner that make you successful. Jacqueline, what's your thought on that? Do you have, you know, you have a different perspective. So like, what do you think makes a great chef? Um, or what's hard about being a chef? I can tell you what I think makes Frank a great chef, which is that he can look at any food and appreciate some, some part of it and take it and cook with it and make it his own and make it delicious in its own right. And he doesn't get bored with it. It never gets old to him. Um, I think it's that way in any profession. Like we work with a contractor who told me that he would never pick up magazines that talk about carpentry because the last thing that he wanted to do when he gets home from work is look about, look at work and think about work. Frank is the opposite. Um, when he's not working, he's looking at cookbooks, he's looking at trade magazines, he's scrolling through other people's menus online. And because he's still delighted by food, it, it comes across in the way he cooks, the way he mentors chefs, I think the way our restaurants run. I will say that if I weren't in the business with him, it, it would put a real strain on our marriage, the kind of hours that go into it and, and the way that he's consumed. If I weren't consumed with food and service too, I don't know that we could still be married. That's a fine line between obsession and passion. Yeah. I think it's definitely more passion right. than it is obsession. I think it's, you, you like to have the conversation. And I will say one of the great things about being a chef is it keeps me young. I mean, I work with 23 year olds all the time. I mean, those are the kids that, that keep you young. They have these ideas, you know, we listen to music and I'm like, holy crap, what are we listening to? I don't make them turn it off. I'm like, okay, it's not for me, but if it makes them happy, I don't care. I, I think that that's one of the, th the things that is so great about being a chef and being in the restaurant business is you're constantly surrounded with young, enthusiastic people with ideas. And if you sit and listen to them, you can learn a whole lot. Like sometimes you don't learn anything other than, boy, they're idiots. But <laughs> I would say 90% of the time, they're good people who, who have great work ethics. I mean, anybody working in the restaurant business has a great work ethic and, and would be successful. I shouldn't say this, but probably at anything they do because they're able to deal with problems on the fly. They, they can look and assess a situation in minutes and fix it. And that, that is the restaurant business. I mean, you are doing it hour and 20 minute bursts at a time, five nights or six nights a week, that, that kind of thinking is a really difficult thing for a lot of people. Like they can't assess, they need, I have to go home and really think about it. Well, she really just wants steamed spinach. Can you do it? <laughs> do you have spinach? Yeah. Can you put it in a pan and steam it? Yeah, I can. Like you don't want those kinds of people. Like, What's, what will it do to the integrity of the dish? Well, it really doesn't matter because she's paying your paycheck. So if she wants steamed spinach, you're going to give it to her because we're in the customer service business. Right. Okay. So when, when you get people in your, in our group that think in those terms of like, it's not what the integrity is. So when you ask back to, what does it take to be a great chef or a good chef? It's the ability to just say that. I, I, I'm here to make you, I'm here for you. And I think too many people don't understand that in the restaurant business, like front and back of the house. This person wants to change dish on the dish. Can we do it? Chef doesn't like it that way. Chef with a capital C. Chef, chef prepares his dishes this way. That, that's such bullshit. Like you prepare food so that people will love it. And if you have someone in who's not, willing to love your food, you try to make it so that they will. Well, and I, lo I love that because like, even like when I cook at home for the family and, you know, the family members start grabbing other spices or start altering what I've put out, like I get offended, <laughs> you know? And like, I, and I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing? Like, this is not the intention. This is not what <laughs> try I, it first. Yes, it's not what I made for you. And so, uh, I think that's a real amazing quality to be that open and flexible and to, to have that, um, Probably less so at our house, though. <laughs> Luca, Luca only will put salt on if I don't salt it enough. But no, like growing up, our kids, we never made two meals. We never right. did any of that. Like we made a meal and if you didn't eat it, 
okay, you'll have a big breakfast tomorrow. Yeah. Sorry. And I think that's why our kids are not picky eaters yeah. too today. Like mm -hmm. we've talked a lot on that subject in other things, but, <laughs> but I think it's, you, you know, if you teach your kids proper manners and how to appreciate what's in front of them and to try it, like just try it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. I mean, God, there could, when we were in Spain, I think we ate more octopus as a family than any other family there. I mean, like, Luca was like, we need three orders of octopus. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the octopus that's pulled out and then put in a tumbler with the rocks and, and all that kind of stuff to keep it soft or uh, tender? Anything, anytime octopus is on the menu, our family is ordering it. Yeah. <laughs> Love we don't care how it's grilled or rolled or cooked raw. We're, we're just like, but that's something that they grew up eating it because I happen to love it. Like squingeli, you know, I don't, I don't know any other kid that would eat squingeli, conk, but Luca and Marco will eat that if I put it, it with shrimp and calamari. Yeah. Chilled. Marco always orders duck. Yeah. It's, it's good. Really good. That's off track. No, it's, <laughs> it's great. So, you know, I, I do want to go back. I, I like to think of you walking around uh, the country clubs of Denver in your knickers and your Stuart Payne hat, <laughs> or maybe your Rodney Dangerfield pants, thinking you're going to be a golfer, golf pro, and teach lessons. And and then you get this opportunity. I mean, it's kind of the big leagues, right? Like, so you're like, like it's not your normal progression. You're not working through all these, you know, Michelin kitchens with an idea that, Hey, I'm going to move right into opening my own. It's like opportunistic to a degree. Like what makes you think that you can pull off a restaurant like this at that time? So the thing was for me, which is what I wanted to do at Mel's was, is I had a very, I, I had, I had worked in some of the best restaurants in the world and I knew what I wanted to do was a different style of cooking that was being, was not being done in Denver. I, I wanted a true brigade system at Mizuna. And I remember telling Doug, my partner at the time, yeah, we're going to have a fish guy. We're going to have a meat guy. We're going to have an entremetier, which is the guy that does nothing but like hot apps. We're going to have like a saucier chef. And then we're going to have a garmage person. And Doug was like, that's, that's like six people in the kitchen. And I was like, yeah. And, and we're going to charge for our food and we have the front of the house staff and we have you, and this will be the best restaurant in Denver. And we will show people what they are getting in New York and LA. And, and if we put a product out with great service, which we knew we could do because Doug was, huh. Doug was unbelievable. I mean, that guy, if you walked in, you hadn't been in in a year, Mr. Gutman, how are you? It's so good to see you. Can I open a bottle of the Chablis for you that you had the last time? I mean, he was just that guy. And he, before service, would go through the reservation book, which at that time was literally a handwritten book. The Smiths are coming in. Last time they were in, they had this wine. They started with two dirty martinis. That, that is the stuff that he was great at. And then when he was at Mel's, we were doing 400 covers. Like you can't give that type of service to 400 people in a three hour period. You know, we were, we were good. Our food was great. Service was extremely good at Mel's for the volume. But I knew if we put Doug in that setting and Doug was able to do exactly what he wanted to do, which was an elegant, he wanted to do more of an elegant French bistro. And I was like, I don't want it to be a bistro at all. I, I want it to be because aubergine was already a bistro. Yeah. We, I wanted it to be white tablecloth, fine dining, multiple courses, tasting menus. And no one was doing that. And I, and I was like, I need six people in the kitchen to do it. And he was just like, okay. And, and I will tell you that our opening staff was every single person except for Bill Messick, who is an executive chef, had left has gone on to open their own restaurant that started with Mizuna, and were there for like five years. Where did the name Mizuna come from? Oh God, <laughs> uh, we struggled uh, immensely, and it, it literally came from our lawyer telling us, "I need a name," and we we had tried every every French name 
Paragord, every, everything had been taken, had been trademarked already. And so I knew my opening menu had some, uh, had some Asian, French Asian dishes on the menu. And I was like, Mizuna, it's easy. And Doug and Jacqueline were like, yeah, no one's going to fuck that up. Mizuna, it's simple. It's easy to say. Most people can spell it. Oh, but they fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> but, We're going to Mizuna tonight. <laughs> but, but literally it was like looking through, I was sitting at the counter over there looking at the produce list and Mizuna was on it. And I was like, what do, what do you think about Mizuna? It's an Asian green. It's like arugula. There isn't one. I mean, there wasn't Google search back then either. So yeah. you had to give it to your attorney and she had to go find out if it had been trademarked and it wasn't. And that was literally how the name came from looking at a produce list and J Jacqueline and Doug just saying, okay. And it was a cool leaf. So fit kind of what we wanted to do. Yeah. Worked out. Yeah. So take us back to opening day. What was that like? I mean, was I Mizuna was Mizuna an instant success or did it yes. did you struggle? No. No. Mizuna was an yes, we were on a three month waiting list from the day we opened. Did that surprise you? Yes. Because I I I would give a lot of that credit to Doug because he had made so many friends over the years. I mean, Doug was at strings, he was at footers for a little while like doug doug was he was uh with quirky douglas at taunt louise at oh, a that's point. Right. i mean doug had just been a consummate front of the house guy and worked in some of the best restaurants in denver and people knew and loved him and people loved mel's so let's go see we got a ton of press when we left i mean you know 5280 was kind of just starting and local press like westward like we we were we were the opening that year. Like there, that was the most anticipated opening of a restaurant. The two guys from Mel's are opening this place called Mizuna. It's a little 40, it was a 40 seat high end French restaurant. And there was nothing like that in Denver because we didn't have this room. We didn't have a bar. There's no bar. No it was bar. In a closet. So yeah, it was three month waiting list. And you know, it just, it was fantastic and it, it was the food we wanted to cook. And back then, yeah, I was one of those chefs that was like, no, I'm not going to give you steamed spinach. And then Doug would come up and say, yes, you are. And I would be, all right, I'll do it. And he was like, D we just have, that's who you learn that for. You have to learn that. Like you don't want to do it, but it's what you need to do. They waited three months to get in here. If she wants just steamed spinach, give it to her. Can I put butter in it? Yeah. I saw so I'd put so much butter in the spinach. It was the best steamed spinach you'd ever have. Um, you know, and then that we rode that for about two years and we decided that, you know, we were pregnant with our second child at that point. And we knew that Mizuna was never going to produce enough money for the, our family and for Doug with how we were running it. Cause we were not, we had a lot of people in the kitchen cooking. We had 16 different kinds of wine glasses. We had a very extensive wine list. You know, it just is not a hugely profitable restaurant when you're in super fine dining. So we were looking at other spaces to, to maybe do a second restaurant or second concept. And that's when literally one, we had looked at the La La space, we had looked at so many other spaces and nothing ever really made sense or we couldn't get it to come together. And one night I was standing out back and the owner of the Chinese restaurant came out and said, oh, how are you business? And I said, eh, it's okay. How's yours? Oh, it's terrible. So would you ever think about selling it? Yeah. You think about buying it? It's like, yeah. How much you want for it? She gave me a number. I knocked her down by like $25,000, went down into the basement, told Doug, we cut her a check for a deposit and the deal was done that night. And what did that restaurant become? Luca. Luca. <laughs> right yeah. next door. Yeah. So it couldn't have been a more perfect scenario. Like we gave her the deposit. We went in for dinner that Sunday night and looked at it and it was disgusting. We were like, but it has, it had legs. Right? Yeah. It had good bones close to Mizuna. It was awesome. Yeah, it felt like the perfect place because I could truly be in both places at the same time. Yeah. And then I always had wanted to go back to doing real Italian food, like homemade, hand-rolled pasta, 
fresh mozzarella, salumi plates, which, you know, now are everywhere. But, you know, growing up, when you asked earlier with how important was food, like every Sunday when the Giants played, my dad and I went out to a deli and we got prosciutto. We got copo, we got mortadella, and we put out a big spread of just like cold cuts. You didn't make sandwiches. You just picked up the pieces of meat and ate them with cheese. And and that was something that was very prevalent where I grew up in New York. I mean, that's just the thing you do. And I was like, we should try this. This is, I think people might like it. And my father was FedExing me in stuff from New Jersey because it wasn't available here. And, you know, it progressed into where uh, my father was like, you need to start figuring out something else because I'm tired of going to FedEx and it's expensive. Like you need to figure out how to make it. So I started learning how to make my own copa and uh, finocetta and soprasada. And years later, we finally perfected it. Yeah. Now you serve that through many of the restaurants. Yeah, we serve that at Osteria, Luca, Salt and Grinders, where the curing room is. And we're legit. So that's good. Police aren't knocking on our door anymore. <laughs> Why would they be knocking on your door? It used to be illegal. And uh, so the meat was hanging in the o- in my office. So it was funny because all day long guys would come up to check out the room. And I smelled like smoky, meaty cheesiness when I got home. <laughs> but it Which was, is kind of hard for a vegetarian. I, it's You appreciate good food. I mean, it's, it was amazing what we were doing. Well, we still are doing, but at the time, nobody was doing that except for us. And then it started, like, I would say four years after, at least four years after you started doing it, it kind of started to trend. And a, and, and then a lot of chefs started curing their own meat. And then the health department cracked down on it. You can't do that. And there, there's good reason for that. There were a lot of chefs doing it who really didn't know what they were doing. And you can't just hang meat at room temperature and not know what you're doing and expect that everyone will live. <laughs> so. Well, it, it, it won't kill you, but you will get some serious yeah. stomach yeah. issues from it. If you don't know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing. And, and yes. We, yeah, we were raided. So the police came in with the health department and raided us because they couldn't find it. It's exciting. Yeah. The police <laughs> left because we had a lease for the offices. Emily was like, these offices have nothing to do with bones. We lease these as a separate company. And the police officer looked at it and said, you're on your own to the health department. They literally just sat there all day. And then they had seen me on, was it Facebook or Instagram or something? Like when I ended up going to court, she had all these pictures of stuff. And we said, this is just for personal consumption. (laughs) <laughs> this is a hobby of mine. That's why it's hidden behind a wall in this room, in this office. We don't serve that. And uh, yeah, no, it was a bad de- it was a bad time. But then we worked. I was the first restaurant to get a HACCP plan approved, and we are legally were able to do it. It took it took us eighteen months, but we finally were able to establish it. And still to this day, I consult with the health department on people trying to do exactly what we do to make sure like she'll send me over if this plan look okay. And then I'll say, no, (laughs) they don't have a stop procedure here where they're testing. And, you know, I mean, it was just, it was just a growing and learning period. So it was a a weird time when everybody was doing it because charcuterie was so popular. Yeah, and so to, just to to clarify, Luca, the name of your your first child and the namesake of the second restaurant. What hap- what, what, what restaurant came after Luca? Marco Osteria Marco. Another named after second Marco, born yeah. child. Yeah. So we yeah. Op- we opened Luca the restaurant on our son Luca's birthday, February fifteenth. So day after Valentine's Day, it was crazy. It was it was a blast, and then we opened Osteria Marco, two thousand eight, and. Bones the same year. Yes. No, and Bones is a ramen noodle uh, concept right on the corner here. So as we go around the corner, starting with Mizuna, we then have Vesper Lounge, mm-hmm. which is another one of your concepts. Bones, which is a ramen noodle concept. And then Luca, just to, to paint the picture. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, the big challenge was when we opened Luca in 2003, right? Yep. My partner... Doug, in our first 
Three months. Three months. June twenty second. Was actually killed by a drunk driver coming home from work, and that was a tough time for us. Not only because of that, but we had. I believe the war in Afghanistan had just started, and that was really the first like televised war, if you remember that. Yeah. Everybody sat home and watched it, and that uh, that war started like a month after we opened, and nobody was going out, and the restaurant Luca just never. It never opened like we were expecting it to open just like they, like Mizuna. We thought this is going to be great. It's Italian. Everything's from scratch. And it was horrible. It was a horrible. Doug was gone. Jacqueline had to quit her job. She was seven, seven months, months pregnant. pregnant. <laughs> um, and it was just a very difficult time. But, you know, we got through it. And it know, was difficult with the. Sp- the, the people that we worked with also, because Doug, he was just really special. So I, I never intended to step into those shoes. I didn't want to step into those shoes. And suddenly I'm in the restaurants all the time. And it, it was just, you know, Frank lost his best friend and his business partner. I lost one of my best friends. Um, the people that we worked with lost a good friend and a good leader. Mm-hmm. It was a very difficult time. Well, and and that's crazy, Jacqueline. I mean, so is this your moment? Is this sort of the inflection point where you really become involved in the the restaurant concepts? Right. So Doug had been asking me to host us and to work in the restaurants when we were short staffed. And I I certainly had the background and the experience. Yeah, a lot of things happened at once. I, I was taking time off work anyway because I was pregnant. And um, realizing that I don't, I didn't know if I would ever have the passion for other people's children anymore now that I had my own. I mean, I loved teaching. I was an amazing teacher. And it just felt like I needed to be in this business, the family business. I, I was more excited about it. It, w- it drove more income. Teachers do not get paid very well. And I we were already paying babysitters almost as much money as I made for, for me to work. So yeah, it was like there, although <laughs> we really didn't have very much time to think about it because Doug was there one day and then Doug was gone. And can you come to work, Jacqueline? Can you figure out how to do the books? Can you? Yeah. I think that that's the funniest part is it, it wasn't necessarily the things that you're so great at now in our business were not the things you started doing for our business. Right. Like she became our finance person. Like her and I would sit and do bank reconciliations, like all the grunt shitty work that no one wants to do. And her nickname was to the penny. And it used to drive me insane that she wouldn't let go of a nine cent paycheck to some dude that we know never cashed it. And she's like, well, we're going to find it. I mean, she like little things like that in the beginning is how it started. And then we finally hired Sadie and it, it progressed. But like her intro into it was helping with the finance side of it, which is ironic that she was like the one that was in charge of all the money. Not ironic. I mean, just because I'm so bad at it. But I was I, good, I was I don't think good you're at, bad it. at it. I don't think you I were thought I was at bad it. at it until I did. Until it. you did it, and then we <laughs> found out how great you are, and then you ended up training the next three people that came along that did the job and trained them to very specific what your demands were for how we do our bank reconciliations, how we do our accounting, how we file things, like. And then thank God you got out of that because I don't think you loved it. Because we were opening Osteria and I, need, I needed to train people and create a training program for the front of the house, so and then that, which that, is what I do. That's that I, I'm in charge of all the front of the house operations, essentially. And design. And design. And how did you figure that out? I mean, was this just a thing that you're just kind of inventing on the fly? Like, like how, do you, how do you figure out how to like start to expand? Because it's one thing to have one restaurant. Then you have two. That seems like, okay, it's kind of manageable. They're next door to each other. But... Like, you know, the, you know, Osteria is over at Larimer Square, which is some distance from us. And now, now, now I have to imagine it starts getting a little real. You can't be everywhere. 
you have to train people. Like, how do you figure that out? Systems. Jacqueline put systems in place. You hire great people. And part of the reason for expansion, quite honestly, is you have great people around you. They're capped out with what they can make with these two restaurants. Philippe, our, our executive chef at Mizuna, like that was the, he was going to go do his own thing because he's capped out at Mizuna. Hey, how about being my partner at this place on Larimer Square and you'll, you'll take it on and you'll run it and you'll help us get it going. And, you know, it, it worked out really well. Like, I mean, that's it. You just advanced people that we had in place that needed to make more money. Has that partnership model, is that the model that you employ now? Are you typically looking for a, a partner to? We do profit sharing rather than partners. Um, we do have several people that have been with us for years that are partners in concepts, but they're mostly in our upper management group. But I think it's more of just growth opportunities for people. Like, how can we get you more money? Yeah. Yeah. And so let's kind of fast forward through some things. What what did the what does the restaurant group look like now? You know, we, we've, we've mentioned a couple of restaurants. You might just want to rattle off kind of all the concepts in the group and talk a little bit about your your latest concept and what's going on there. So uh, it, it feels like we've opened a lot of restaurants in pairs. So we opened Osteria Marco, which is on Larimer Square. It was the first time that we needed to create training manuals and systems, and that was very eye opening to us. And we tried to implement those with the three restaurants we had at the time. Then we had an opportunity to open Bones, which was on the corner in between Mizuna and Luca. Tiny noodle spot. That's what Frank wanted to do there. So we opened that. Like We're implementing the training manuals now. Then the Larimer group came to us and they said that there was a bar that was going out of business and they asked us if we wanted to take it over. And the bar was named Below, but it was spelled B-L-O-W and it was a big Coke S&M bar. <laughs> and we saw an opportunity there to serve cocktails in line with our vision of food, like beautiful ingredient driven cocktails in an environment where there is a seat for your body when you come in. So Green Russell was the next restaurant right across the street from Osteria Marco, um, had a space next to it. We needed to do something there because there's a big footprint. So we did Russell's Smokehouse. So now we're Russell Smokehouse, Green Russell, Osteria Marco, Luca, Mizuna, Bones, there was a dive bar in between Bones and Mizuna called Lancer Lounge. The owner was... Becky. Yeah. She was in a financial pickle and ready to get out of the business and came to us. And that became Vesper. And we kept it as a neighborhood bar with really, really good Greek food. If you ever tried, it's amazing. So, so now we have all these four restaurants on the corner. Osteria Marco, Green Russell, Russell Smokehouse downtown. We had an opportunity to open a deli in our neighborhood. That's Salt and Grinder. Um, we use the basement at Salt and Grinder to cure all the meats for all of the restaurants now. French 75 is more in the theater district. That was um, our most recent independent restaurant opportunity. And then Almost exactly a year ago, we opened the Denver Milk Market, which is 18,000 square feet? 20. 20,000 square feet, 16 restaurants, three bars, commissary kitchen. That's like, that's a beast. It's a bigger deal. Yeah. That's and so like, how big is the group now? So you started Mizuna, you and Doug, and how many people in, in the restaurant? 12. 12. And 12 now, people. Now, now, given that, you know, great. 540 people. Can you believe it? No, it's overwhelming. Yeah, and and not only 540 people, but I, I want to talk about Denver Milk Market a little bit more because this is a concept that is is really uh, a flagship concept in Denver, but also like Bonanno concepts and the Bonanno restaurants have become synonymous with the Denver restaurant scene. What's happening here? I mean, you've really made a a mark, a home, you know, you've been here uh, for, for a while and you stayed in the game, which is not easy in the restaurant business. I mean, did you ever think that you'd be able to, to build a, a restaurant group like this? No. <laughs> if you'd asked me this 20 years ago, I, I probably would have said 15 years ago, I would have said I was very content with Osteria Marco, yeah, Luca and Mizuna. Like but then you good. see another opportunity. You walk into a space. Like I remember walking into Below and all you, you see, see is the potential. You can just see exactly what it should be. We're underneath Larimer Square. There are no windows here. This can only be a bar. 
couldn't this be a really cool bar? Couldn't this be really elegant? Couldn't it be ingredient? Frank, you've got to see this. This is amazing. And that, and that's how it was with when we went to Milk Market, they were pitching us to be an anchor tenant. So it would have been probably a three to 4,000 square foot restaurant, maybe Italian food. And you walk into this canvas and all you can see is what it could be. This could be a lot of restaurants and some cooking retail. And we could open these windows onto the alley and people could just come in and go and there'd be music. Like all you can see is what it could be. Right. I mean, And then you're not satisfied with what you have. So when we looked at Milk Market and they gave us the floor plan and it was literally what is Denver Milk Market today was divided up into eight separate restaurants, four that went into the alley and four that went out onto Wazi. And Jacqueline and I were like, what do we need to do another 4,000 square foot restaurant for? Like, we already have two of them. Like, that's not exciting. That's not fun. And if it does okay, that's great. But Jacqueline and I were just like, what if we took this whole thing and we did the food hall? We had pitched this concept to Larimer Square when Z Gallery went out of business. Yeah, that's right. When... Tom, before Tom's Urban, we pinched it to do a small version of it there on Larimer Square. And it just never happened. And then like five years later, this space became available. And we were like, we went into the meeting with Jacqueline's sketches of what the logos would look like. And on me with a lot of jazz hands and in front of the whole board. And Walter Eisenberg, the owner of Sage, was like, that was not the presentation we were looking for. <laughs> they thought there was going to be slideshows and, and financial PowerPoint, whatever. <laughs> and I, I was like, that that's not us. We're a visionary people. Yeah. Like, this is what we think we can do here. And they were like, we love it. Get with an architect. Yeah. And it just kind of moved from there. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's an incredible concept that's been executed. So, you know, encourage everyone listening to go uh, check it out. It, it, it's amazing. And it's unique in the sense that you did do all the concepts. I mean, that's not normally how a food hall works. Like what made you think that you could do that? And why did you want to take on all those concepts? I can speak to the, can I speak this? So, <laughs> so we, we start the, I think the craftsmanship and the cooking with Frank really came into play when we opened Luca. Um, the bread that we were getting, Frank wasn't satisfied with, so he figured out how to make a really great focaccia. We couldn't find local vendor for prosciutto, so he figured out how to cure meat. Um, we, we, we brought, we were the first people to bring burrata in, then we were the first people to figure out how to make it. And that kind of craftsmanship followed us into all of the other restaurants. So we go to Bones and we're doing these like brothy noodle bowls and everything is from scratch. So now we figured out these amazing buns with duck fat crafted by hand. So we have this skill set now under our belt. Then Osteria Marco, we have these hand-tossed pizzas with these artisanal ingredients and the burrata and the, the meats. And every time we open a restaurant, we're kind of expanding our culinary repertoire. So then at Green Russell, we're cocktail forward with these beautiful cocktails. Smokehouse opens, and now we're like d doing all these smoky... D anyway... <laughs> Oh, as the years go on, we've accumulated this culinary profile and we're ready. We can do buns and pizza and cheeses and meats and deli food and hamburgers. And why not bring all of this expertise and all of these people we've been training under one roof? It, like we, we had the infrastructure, we had the talent. It, it was kind of a, it felt more natural than it sounds to me. Although this is the first food hall type concept in which every single food stall is owned and operated by a single chef. Yeah. And so. what's the benefit of that? <laughs> or, or the, or the not the benefit. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the, the one benefit is, is that why I wanted to do it as well is, is to be able to share, right? Like to, the purchasing power you'd get is being able to take all of our restaurants and this massive thing, purchasing power, lower food costs, sharing of product, right? So like Bao can get all of its meat from Ruth's and there's places to cook it and things that if an independent person went in to take Bao, like if we leased it out to them, where would they cook all their food? 
right? There's no stove, there's no oven. Like it, that concept wouldn't work in that space unless you were part of this aggregate team. And that was really the whole feeling behind it was, is if you could have all these concepts working together to, to have limit labor, like, and to just make it a better business model. Cause you know, I, I've looked at like, we owned a place at Avanti and the big gripe was, is there's never anywhere to wash dishes. There's nowhere to do prep. There's no food storage. There's, you know, and then we traveled around the country and those were the common themes amongst food halls is the landlord is making all the money off of the bar and all these tenants are just busting their ass and they don't have all the right stuff they need. So why wouldn't we just do it all Yeah, a and have control? We're, we're also kind of controlling people. So it would suck to have to manage somebody and be like, Hey, your food stalls, you know, it's not good. You're not living up to what the standards are of what we have in mind. And I don't think people would like that. Yeah. I also think from a customer perspective, it's amazing, right? Because you have that same benefit and sharing and cohesiveness as a, as a client. And when you come in, you, you're not disjointed. You can go to any, in any stall. They're going to share information about, you know, either Bow or Ruth's or the other concepts or the bar. And, uh, it, it makes for this really amazing, you know, I, I like this idea that it's like, it's guilt free, you know, like I was in Chelsea market not that long ago and you're not going to go up to the noodle people and ask them about the uh, seafood place. It's just very clear that they're separate organizations. And and, and then that's just confusing because I don't know, I don't know where to go. I don't know how this works. I don't know where to sit. And so that, that shared uh, resource is a real benefit to the, the customers as well. Yes. Yeah. All right. So what's next for Bonanno Concepts? What are you looking forward to? <laughs> I guess uh, Osteria Marco at DIA. Oh, that's right. In 2020, May of 2020. Bringing great food to the airport. Yes. So we are currently working with Davis Partnerships on the renderings and the architectural drawings. And, you know, that will be another challenge. And and we'll have some food at Bronco, at Mile High Stadium next year. Yeah, actually, I'm... I'm partnered with Aramark and I'm putting in a uh, cultivated space that will change and hopefully spawn off other sites at Mile High Stadium. Awesome. So it's a question we close out with everyone on the show that I'd like you each to answer separately. But if the 20 year old self could see you now, what would they say? Wow, you're fat and bald. I was thinking wrinkles. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Honestly, the I 20 year old self looking at me now would probably say, I can't believe what you've accomplished. That that would be it, probably. I never thought you'd be here. Right. In a good and bad light. <laughs> I never had a clear vision of having children. It was just never in my forecast. And I think the 20 year old me would look at all of these children, the two children, Luca and Marco, and then all these restaurants and be like, wow, that's pretty beautiful. I, I would have to echo that Marco and Luca, the children are probably the best thing we've ever done. Yeah. The restaurants are great, but the kids themselves, when you can just hang out, on Sunday and watch Game of Thrones with your kids. Yeah. And they know more about it than you do. That That's pretty awesome. And, and for me, that is the most satisfying thing. It's a good reminder. when And, and they remind you. You get caught up in the day-to-day. -day and all of a sudden, they demand your attention. And you're like, oh, that's right. All of this, all of these restaurants, all of these people are really for this moment at home. And so it just calls your attention to what it really is supposed to be about for me. Right. I mean, I, just some of the, some of the people we work with too, like if you had told me when I was 20 that I'm going to be working with this great kid that's 31 years old and making a ton of money, like that I love to death, like that I would have been shocked that I'm able to work with this person and allow 
and, and they've, they've gained this opportunity to be where they are and they love their job. Like that is so satisfying to me to know that the, there are people in our group that I, are our family. I mean, they truly are family and that they may move on, but you know, we're a lot of our employees are our average tenured employee is like six years. And in our management group, it's probably going to be 12 to 15 years. I think about my dad. When my dad was 54, he was um, eyeing retirement. And I, I can't even imagine that. And he was counting the days. And I, I love what we do. I love it. I love getting up in the morning. I mean, it's scary. It's daunting, all these people that rely on us and the debt that we incur. But it's also super exciting. You still have ten years to <laughs> at least. <laughs> do you think? Do you think your? Uh, do you think the next generation will will eventually come in and take over the the restaurant group? Is that the plan? Oh God! <laughs> do you think? Or they not know yet? <laughs> Luca, no way. He does no way. No, I, I, I don't know. No, I think this company will be passed on to the people that are running it now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, thinking back to your father and his reaction about about food and cooking, you know, and I like to, you know, kind of bookend it with how you're going to pass on, you know? Yeah. I mean, if Marco or Luca did have a propensity for it, Marco may in cooking, but I don't know. Luca for sure. in maybe the finance side of it, he does love kind of hanging out with Nick and looking at the computer and doing some of that stuff and the graphic design stuff that you do with them. So there may be a part for it, but I don't know them running it. I don't know that that would be a, We've many years before. We'll see that. if Nick lets that happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's a great place to end. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank and you. Yeah, it's really, yeah. really amazing. Thank you very much for having us. Well, if you're not hungry for pizza right now, you are crazy. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. The one thing you can't see during the interview is the mutual love and appreciation. Jacqueline and Frank have for one another. I hope you heard it. They are a true team, better together, and a living example of how one plus one equals 11. Off the air, Jacqueline and Frank told me about some plans they have in the works, and I can't wait for them to become reality. They mentioned it, but the Bananos are all about family and their purpose, creating happy people. Stop by one of their restaurants, and you can't help but leave happy. Well, that's it for today. Until next time. Make sure to visit our website, www.wildstory.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. I like big stories, and I cannot lie. You other storytellers can't deny. Baby got backstory. You'll also find free story downloads and resources to help you integrate the power of story into your business. 